when I was reading through Isaiah 44, I realized that there were kind of three parts to it. There was a first part for, say, the first nine or ten verses, which were rather kind of inspiring. It's where God thinks, says things like, I am the first and the last. And then there was a second, I, I, let, let me see, there was, there was a third bit right at the end where God goes on again to reaffirm his promises to Israel. And again, that was something that's rather uplifting. But in between from about verse 11 through to verse 21, 22, there is the kind of the meat in the, the, the filling in the, in, in the sandwich or the sub. And the filling isn't very pleasant, or it's, how should I put this? It's not very edifying or very nourishing. It's like, you know, getting, eat, eating nothing but peanut butter. Every, in fact, it's not even as good as peanut butter every day because it's a narrative about somebody who thinks he is worshiping God, but he isn't. He's worshiping the work of his own hands. It is a he here. It's a craftsman. I suppose it's not gender specific. Um, there could be people, perhaps even people that I see sometimes on social media who are, they're not all women, but many of them are women, who will just get fixated about the work of their hands when it comes to things like baking. Like the, the Great British Bake Off is something that we have, and I believe it's quite popular over here. So whatever you do with the work of your hands, sometimes you can actually funnily think that that has something to do with God. And that's particularly at risk for those of you who are going into ministry or who think that you're doing something that is of particular service to God. But maybe, just maybe, you take your eyes off the Lord and your eyes are more on the thing that you're doing. Now, I know that when we look at Isaiah 44, it talks about somebody, let me just, just get it on the, on the text here. It's about fashioning an idol. It's about somebody who's an ironsmith who cuts a tool and then he gets something and works it with the, with the coals. He hammers it, he works it. He gets a bit hungry, he gets a bit faint, he comes back the next day to do it. Or perhaps wood is involved and it has to be shaped into the figure of a human being with the beauty of a human being. Perhaps the person has to go and get the wood in the first place to make what we call now an idol. But he doesn't think it's an idol. He thinks it's a help for him to really come into the presence of God. This is a kind of rather sad thing. And the comedy is, and it is kind of slightly comic, um, it's a bit pathetic in some ways, but it's sort of also kind of funny, you know, in that way that you're not quite sure whether to laugh or to cry when you hear that somebody says that he takes part of this piece of wood and he warms himself with part of that piece of wood. And with part of that piece of wood, another part, he then puts it on the fire and he uses that to, to kindle a fire to, to bake his own bread so he can eat. So he gets warmth from the, from, the, from the wood. He gets food indirectly from the wood. And then with what's left over, he makes a god and worships it, says the text. So, and then it repeats and says, I've done all this stuff, and now with a bit of wood that's left over, I'm going to make something that I will fall down and worship. And he prays to it and says, deliver me, for you are my god. And this kind of is, is presented in a way which, as I say, is somewhat humorous and somewhat sad. We're not quite sure how to respond to it except to say that this is not, this is not the worship of the Lord, but it's something which is very easy for the people of Israel to fall into. This person that's being described, we don't kind of know, it's obviously not just one person, there's got a lot of people doing this, no names are mentioned. This person who's doing this has, in some sense, wandered from the truth of what God has revealed about worship. It's not that this person is somebody from a kind of pagan background or is from the outside or is from part of the nations who don't know any better. This is actually somebody in Israel. You might want to say this is like for today, someone from within the church, someone who's been brought up in a very traditional, godly uh, family and, and, and college and all the rest of it. Nevertheless, seems to think that you can, when, it, when it comes to worshiping God, you can worship God through what you have done yourself, through the work of your hands somehow. I know that sounds a little bit abstract, but I think it's probably good when, you're, when I'm saying this, I don't know what, you, what your idol might be. There may be different things for different people, of course. So could you just imagine maybe there's something that you actually are doing, which actually is very, it's not bad, it's a good thing that you're doing, you're spending your energy on and you maybe think that God is to be found in this thing. I can think of an obvious example is somebody like myself. 
Um, I don't want to say my colleagues are like this. <laughs> I'll just speak about myself. But my, my job is a kind of a meaningful one. I get to teach theology. I get to teach Bible. So it feels kind of meaningful. It feels kind of important and significant. At least to me it does. And I then start to think that if I just spend a little bit more preparation, if I just read another little book or another article, or a big book or a big article, I will then be just slightly wiser I'm better able to serve God. And if that means staying up too late on a Saturday night and skipping church on Sunday, or if it means not seeing my family or not having good relationships with people or not praying, not being aware of who God is as a whole, as God is, God is bigger than my life. But suddenly, it's very easy for someone who calls himself a theologian to think that God is part of your life, that God is part of my career that I kind of use God to kind of write the things I want to write and the thoughts I want to think and deliver and build up a reputation about. So very subtly, sometimes that can happen and we don't realize it's happening. And I think this may be kind of, although it's more comic, this person who's getting, who may be a craftsman in some way, that, he, that in his craft, he suddenly realizes he's sort of worshiping what he's made. It's maybe not such an unusual thing. It's maybe a sort of very sort of striking example of something which is maybe rather common or can be, it's a temptation. Now, I don't want to stick with that, although it's a kind of an interesting passage, and um, one of the commentators says that the poetry in this passage, the middle of, the, of Isaiah 44, is actually quite poor poetry. It's the word we have, and I don't know if we have it over here, but the word is doggerel. Doggerel doesn't sound like something that's good quality. It's only fit for the dogs or something. Um, so it's not good quality, and, and the commentator says that's because the form of the poetry kind of resembles the content of what's going on in the text at this point. This isn't good stuff. This is very poor quality religion, very poor quality spirituality. So we know that God desires to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. That's what Jesus tells us in John. We also know that in the Ten Commandments, in fact, it's right at the very beginning. You might say it's the fundamental thing about God, about knowing God, that you, you worship him without recourse to your imagined images of what God might look like. The Old Testament in Exodus and Deuteronomy tells us to sit still and listen to what God says about himself, not to what we might want to make of him, what we think he should like, look like. And so that's a discipline for us to, 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 to listen to how God reveals himself, not to try to, uh, to, to work out for ourselves what God looks like. God, the prophet then goes on to say, unfortunately, we don't just, um, we don't just, whoops, I knew that was going to happen. We don't just stop with the, um, the bad news, as it were, with this person who is uh, doing things the wrong way. But nor does Isaiah the prophet then tell us, you know, and this is the right way now. And Isaiah himself has got all the answers. No, Isaiah only has any answers to give because he wants to talk about who God is. So in some sense, the focus of our thinking, the focus of our worship should always be on God himself and what God is doing. So let's think about God in, in this, this passage. And he goes on to say, towards the end of the passage in verses of 22, 23, that what God can do that idols cannot do, or any gods of any sort, is to announce the future. That's the thing that makes God different from the God of the nations. Because God, first of all, is real. God is all-knowing. God is sovereign. God can direct the present as well as redeeming the past, and he can shape the future. There's a verse right at the very beginning of, of, of chapter 44, where it says that the Lord will be the shaper, the shaper, that's the word that's used in Hebrew, from your womb. And we know that in Psalm 139, it talks about the Lord being the one who gives shape to us in the womb of our mothers, but what Isaiah says, the Lord will be the shaper of you from your womb. So for, not just in your development over those nine months, but from that point onwards, the Lord will continue to shape as he provides for us. He doesn't only create us, he provides for us 
so that we, we grow up to be strong, um, like trees, that Isaiah says, trees that can stand up in the desert. If you go into a desert area, sometimes you think, you see, there's no grass, but there are a few trees. Trees can make it in the desert in a way that grass can't. And quite often, the Old Testament uses the image of the, the tree that is able to, to, to go deep with its roots and receive from the Lord, the Lord's provision, the Lord's nourishment. And we hear here that the Lord will be a shaper of you if you trust in him, Israel, from your womb onwards. So God has redeemed and God will redeem and God is redeeming. And that is something which needs to sink in into our minds and into our hearts. God is a God who is there waiting for us, who wants to be propitious, which is a big word for saying he wants to be pleased and well disposed towards us. This is not a God who can be controlled, however. This is not a God who is like a household God that can be tamed and become part of my life and become part of my projects, and become part of my household and all that I do. But this is a God who I have to find my place in his scheme of things. The ancient commentator Theodoret, um, probably not many will have heard of him. He wasn't all that, he wasn't, he wasn't much of a character. I think he was more of a kind of a, a scholar. So he wasn't very interesting as a person. But he said interesting things from time to time, which scholars can do. They don't make for the best kind of biographies and you, you wouldn't want to pick up a, an airport biography of Theodoret, but you might want to read or hear just a few things he had to say. And Theodoret says this about verse 23 from the passage as we're getting towards the, towards the end of the, sort of the highlight of the passage where in some sense the answer is given to this, this rather problematic issue of idolatry. And that is that Theodoret says, the prophet calls upon the heavens and the earth to serve as a witness to him. And he invites creation to partake in the joy now, that's not that he thinks that, this is Theodoret, that the elements are animate. But when we are depressed, the elements seem somber to us. We look outside today, if you're a Californian, you'll think it's rather somber out there. When we're happy, the heavens and the earth seem more radiant. It's not the elements that change, but to us in their appearance, they change. So we're not saying that the elements of heaven and the earth is in some, some sense our kind of characters in a, in a play or are real in that sense. But the Lord has said, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents, the Gospel of Luke. In this way, says Theodoret, one will likewise understand the mountains, the hills, and the woods on them. After the return of Israel, because they were cultivated, they had flourished again and were the source of rejoicing on the mountains. The heaven and the earth rejoices in the restoration and the redemption of Israel, just in the same way as the angels rejoice. We can talk about that that way. Praise is the order of the day, taking our minds off ourselves, off our worries, off our big projects, and making sure that God receives attention. But of course, it's part of idolatry, isn't it? Part of us putting things more importantly, and so having them as our God, even though they're kind of Christian things. But our minds wander, even during prayers, even during sermons like this one, maybe most especially during sermons like this one, the, 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 our attention can go away from, from praising God. Our mind goes that way. Quite often our minds wandering is reinforced by anxiety. I think this was being said to you just 10 minutes ago, that we, in some sense, don't trust, and we need, in some sense, some source of energy that makes God and his ways and his concerns and his calling to us the absolutely most real thing in the world. Sometimes that comes, we listen, we hear God, God seems more real at times of suffering, times of when things are really, really bad, and we have to kind of do business with God. We have to, to kind of come very close to God and draw close to him. Those are moments of crisis. 
but not all of life is crisis. Sometimes life can be so ordinary. Sometimes life can be so routine that it has a certain kind, of, we need routine, don't we? We need more routine than kind of crisis, I think, if we're gonna get anything done, if we're going to um, be educated, if we're going to be creative, if we're going to be people who can make a difference. But we also need something that's going to not just get us up in the morning, although that's a good thing, something that gets you up in the morning, but also something that helps us to sleep at night. Is the what, what, which gets us up in the morning the thing that's keeping us awake at night? Is the sense that we're burdened by an anxiety that we have to get up and work and in some sense push the anxious thoughts out of our minds? If I lost my job tomorrow, or if as I study, my grades are not so good, or for some reason, my professional career that I have chosen or I want to have was to disappear, could I cope with that? Would I find God in that? Would I find God there even when the other things disappear in front of him as it were? Is there a danger that our lives perhaps become one dimensional when they become too purpose driven? Now we always hear that it's good to have a purpose in your life, to be driven by a purpose. And I agree with that and I think it's, it's a bit like, you know, the earth has to keep spinning if we're not all going to fall off, you know. The earth has to have a direction, it has to have a motion, things have to go. Um, there's only going to be fixity if in some, things, in some sense things are moving, and particularly if you're moving to a God-directed goal that you believe God is calling you to, then that, that, all that is super, all that is to be, to be valued and appreciated. However, what about when we get exhausted? What about when the purpose that is driving us drives us a little bit too hard or we maybe put too many things on ourselves? What about the danger of isolation when those of us who feel sort of too wired and too kind of energized perhaps and then tired are not really able to have conversations which are enriching and certainly our prayer life is far from what it could be. There's no amount of successful work or successful leisure even. There's no amount of my becoming more the person that Christ calls me to be that will actually teach me about who I am in God's sight and why God loves me and how God loves me. The important thing I think is to realize that we are not justified by our achievements but that we are simply justified by what God has done to us through Christ as an expression of love that he has the Father for his children and wishes us to, to hold our, our hands to him for that purpose. Where can we find that trust? Where can we find that boldness to come before the cross and to find our identity in him and him alone? Well, we can find it in deep community. We can find it where in some sense we come as friends and pull our resources or even pull our fears and our weaknesses together in a way that not only by coming together on a regular basis do we refuel, because if we think too much in terms of the refueling, although the refueling is important because we've got things to do, battles to fight out in the world with ourselves, perhaps with others, difficult situations, family, friends, uh, jobs, health, etc. So we do need refueling. I'm not saying we don't need refueling. We do need time out to, to do that. But we also need, I think, to realize that even in our work, even in our activity, there should be a note of ultimately seeing the purpose as that which has to do with dwelling in God. We're not to be solitary. And when I say we're not to be solitary, that means that we not only come together as believers who have something in common of a spiritual nature which binds us for all our differences, but that we come into the community of the triune God. Now that sounds very fancy to say we come into the life of the Trinity. But the more I've thought about this, it's not to say that I think I become part of God or, or I, be, I move into God's house or God takes me in as a lodger or something like that into himself, but it's more that God reaches down to where I am as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And although God himself is beyond and elsewhere and 
much, much greater, infinite. Nevertheless, he says that he will choose to make his home with a person who is humble in heart and to dwell with that person. So the idea of a group of little children waiting on their heavenly father is perhaps a metaphor which is a metaphor which Jesus gives us, the idea of little children coming before their heavenly father, which is, and I would argue is more fundamental than other metaphors for the Christian life. Say the metaphor of being an athlete in training who needs, like Paul says, to beat his own body so that he's fit for service. That's a great metaphor. Or sometimes we, there's, the New Testament also talks about us being in some ways like soldiers of Christ and putting on the armor of Christ. And that's a great metaphor too. But those are things that we put on for, for, for mission. Those are things that we put on because God is calling them to do, us to do those things. But more foundational than that is the fact that we are like little children, almost naked with very little on, just running about in the, in the presence of our Heavenly Father. I don't want to sentimentalize that. We're not to be seeing ourselves as little children who don't grow up in some sense. No, rather that even as we grow up in faith and wisdom and stature, that we actually be our people who come to really understand what it is to be children of a father. I mean, little children don't understand what that is. They just act that way. What we are called to do is have that kind of second child, childhoodness or something, childlikeness, I should say, where we don't only just be act or relate to God as children to a father, but we also know that that is the case. That's the difference from being a child. The child doesn't know. He just trusts or she just trusts in her parents. And with God, are we trusting but knowing we are trusting? And I think that ability to know that we're trusting I know who we're trusting, I know what that means, can be of great benefit as a fundamental foundational thing, a foundational metaphor for our Christian life. So I would just want to comp- you know, get to, to complete this sermon, which I knew you notice I didn't say anything about Cyrus, who comes at the end of the passage, so it's just after the text. I could have finished there at verse 23. Verse 25 talks about Cyrus, and I know that in American politics, a lot of people talk about Cyrus and who that might be in the order of things. In some sense, that is important. World history is very important for God. Don't think that it's not, that we don't think we, we live to escape from that as Christians. But just like Paul is an athlete, works towards being an athlete, just as Paul as a soldier of Christ works towards that, just as Paul as somebody who has something to say to government and to the state and to tell the people in Romans just what to think about paying your taxes or disobeying or obeying, all those things are kind of, those are things to, to get around to, but what is fundamental is our disposition before the Father as little children, to trust in him and to work from that attitude of trust. So I just want to say, in closing, if you're feeling stuck, relax. If you're feeling afraid, don't care. Because in the fear, in the caring, in the paralysis, a lot of energy is being burnt up. Allow your Heavenly Father to lift you Allow him to guide you. Allow him to be with you this day and onwards. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.